continue our journey through 1 Peter and here in chapter 3 we are going to see that as God's people we need to be prepared. As always, please do take some time to read through the passage for yourself just to familiarize yourself with what is um, what Peter's main ideas are. Look for repeated words or ideas and note them down and if you are confused about sections and there are verses in this section that are particularly confusing uh, you may want to jot down some question marks and I'm going to do my best to explain this passage. Why I called it we are prepared uh, is linking to this section. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So we're focusing in on hope here. The hope that Peter has spoken of in chapter 1 already. Speaking of our living hope that is ours because of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus from the dead. We have a great hope. A hope that is rooted in the past. A, ro- a hope that continues in the present. And a hope that will be completed in the future. When Jesus returns to take his children home. And it is that hope that drives us to live, as we saw in chapter 2, such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse us of doing wrong, they may see our good deeds and glorify God. And in this passage we see this idea of doing good continues in Peter's uh, conversation. Peter is still concerned for his readers to be a, a people who live good lives, who do what is right. But as they do that, we've seen um, hints throughout the letter so far that life is going to be hard for God's people and suffering will come. And from this point on in the letter, there's a whole lot more focus on the suffering that we will face as Christians. So even if you should suffer, he says, suffering for doing good. And then he links our suffering with the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ and helps us to see how we should be a people who continue to do good knowing that suffering will come. And it is our hope in Jesus that fuels us to do what is right, to do good. And it is our hope in Jesus that enables us to endure suffering until that day when we are with Jesus for all eternity. I saw a division in this text at verse 18. And Peter's linking word for uh, helped me to see that, that division. And there's a big focus on our Lord Jesus Christ in this section. It says here, revere Christ as Lord or honor Christ or set Christ apart in your heart as Lord And it is our good behavior is motivated by our Lord Jesus Christ. And then from verse 18, Peter puts the spotlight on Jesus to show how Jesus suffered and then was vindicated. He was put to death in the body, but was made alive in the spirit. Peter wants to remind us how the death of our Lord Jesus for our sins has has brought us to God. Um, How we have been saved. And how our Our baptism points to the salvation that is ours because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is now seated and reigning in glory. We've seen this idea of submission a couple of times in Peter's letter. Um, Slaves, obey to your, submit to your masters, submit to all those in authority, wives, submit to your husbands. And Peter brings in this idea of submission, but it's in a different way that he speaks of submission here saying that ultimately at the end of time, we will see all things in submission to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where history is headed. Just a couple more repetitions. We see Peter mentions twice this keeping a clear conscience and how our baptism um, shows that we have a clear conscience before God because we are it's an outward sign of the inward reality that we have been saved by the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Now the big focus of these first couple of verses is this being prepared to give a reason that anyone who asks about our hope 
And it is our good behavior that is going to be the thing that causes people to ask us. It is our willingness to endure suffering while we do this good that is going to cause people to ask us about the hope that we have. And we need to be ready to, to give an answer. Uh, Peter says in verse 14 here, uh, do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. He's quoting from Isaiah 8. Uh, this is a section in Isaiah that is all about fearing God as we wait for the Lord. And that is what Peter wants his readers to be doing. That's what he wants us to be doing, to be fearing God, to revering Christ as Lord. And that will fuel us to do what is right, to endure suffering. And as we live this way, as I've said, we need to be ready to give the answer for the hope that we have. But we need to do this with gentleness and respect. The way we answer is very important. We want to be answering in a way that will point those around us to our Lord Jesus. And these good lives, if you want to know what Peter's talking about with those good lives, you can go back to the previous section where we saw Peter said, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Don't repay evil with evil. Watch your words. Pursue peace. This is the good that we are called to do. And as we live this way, it will be living in a way that demands explanation. Our lives should demand explanation. People should see the way we live and they should ask us questions. And that gives us the opportunity to point to the hope that we have. So even as people speak maliciously against us, it is because we're living good lives in our Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately, they will be ashamed of their slander. And Peter says, expect the suffering. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now in verses 18 to 22, we come to one of the most confusing sections in the whole New Testament. On one level, it's easy for us to see what is happening here. Um, Peter is, is giving us the pattern for life in this world, and that is suffering now and vindication later. Suffering now, vindication later. And he shows this firstly in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. He suffered once for sins, he was put to death, but then he was made alive in the Spirit. And here in verse 22, we see that he has gone into heaven, is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. He has been vindicated. He faced suffering for our sins to bring us to God and then was vindicated. He was made alive. He is seated in glory. Then we get to some very confusing verses. Uh, in verse 19 and 20, Martin Luther, who was a great and very smart reformer, said about this text, a wonderful text is this, and more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament. So he's talking here about verse 19 and 20 and saying, and then he continues and he says, so that I do not know for a certainty just what Peter means. I cannot understand and I cannot explain it. And there has been no one who has explained it. And there are lots of things that are confusing. In the original Greek, there, it's not simple to see exactly what Peter was meaning. Obviously, to Peter's original readers, they would have understood exactly what Peter was talking about. They had the context that we do not have. Um, but we do need to remember that we've got to read these verses in the light of the whole passage, in the light of the whole of 1 Peter. And I think a better translation here is he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Now, there's lots of questions about, OK, so when? When did he go and make this proclamation? Who exactly are these imprisoned spirits? Uh, why does he bring Noah into the story now and kind of single out that generation? There, there are lots of questions in this text. But if we want to read this in the light of suffering now and vindication later, I think that will help us to make sense of what Peter is saying. 
Saying so, he was put to death in the body, made alive in the spirit, and in that spirit, in the spirit of Christ, went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Okay, so it's in the days of Noah while the ark was being built when this proclamation in the spirit was made. That's, that's how I see the text working here. So I think what Peter is saying is that long ago, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the power of the Spirit, preached through Noah to the people of Noah's day. And as Noah preached in the power of the Spirit, it brought him suffering, suffering now. But Noah was willing to suffer because he had placed his hope in the promises of God. And Noah was vindicated when the rain started to fall. But those who didn't listen to his preaching ended up as imprisoned spirits. They faced God's judgment because they wouldn't listen. So Peter is giving us this pattern. He's shown it in Jesus, suffering now, vindication later. He's showing it in Noah's life, suffering now, vindication later. Now you can go and dig into what the commentators say on these verses if you want to. And there is a huge amount of discussion on them and very little consensus. But if we read it all in the context, I think it is helpful for us to see. Okay, so Noah was somebody who suffered and then was vindicated as the Spirit of Christ preached through him to the people of his day as he waited patiently, hoping in God's promises. And then Peter goes and links in with the waters of baptism here. Again, in this whole idea of suffering and vindication, the waters of the flood were vindication for Noah, showing that his hope was well placed. And for us, the waters of baptism that now save you show that our hope is well placed. It's not the waters themselves that save, but it is the picture that our baptism points to. Our baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality, the reality that we have been saved. And when we are baptized, we are pointing to those around us and saying that our hope has been well placed because our hope has been placed in the salvation that is ours because of the resurrection of Jesus, who is now seated in glory. That is our hope. Jesus rose, Jesus seated in glory, one day he's coming. And it is with this hope, even in the face of suffering, knowing that vindication is coming, as we live in this world, we are to do good. We should be eager to do good and ready to answer when people ask us why we live these good lives. We are enabled to endure suffering and we are ready to answer when people ask us why we endure suffering the way we do. It is all because we have hope. Hope in our Lord Jesus. Now there is so much more that we can dig into in these verses. But I'm going to leave it at that point. And I trust as you dig in further that you would be blessed by this passage. And don't lose sight of the big things that Peter is saying. Verse 18 is absolutely incredible. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. We've been brought to God. And because we have been brought to God, we have a great hope. Don't get lost in these details. Um, trust that God in his wisdom has given us his word. He wants us to show the pattern of suffering now, vindication later. We have a great hope. And let's live in the light of that hope and be ready to give the reason that we have for our hope. So God bless as you dig in further.